Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thanks for joining us. In this video, we are going to discuss containers in C++. What's in a container? We are going to talk about the abstraction that containers provide in C++. The main focus will center around why the implementation of a container really matters to anyone using the container, and what you should look for in the documentation or specifications of a container. The fundamental abstraction that containers provide is the ability to store a collection of elements. In C++ containers, each element in the container must be the same data type. The interesting part of the abstraction that containers provide is that the container is responsible for allocating memory in proportion to the size of the data type it is storing. A lot of the power of a container comes from the automatic memory management. Containers are implemented as a template, which means the container class should be written assuming as little as possible about the data types it will store. Containers are broken down into a couple different categories. The simplest category is the sequential containers. In this type of a container, the user controls the order of elements. And that order depends on when and where an element was added into the container. The associative containers are containers where you don't get to say where an element goes. Instead, the value of an element determines where it fits in the container. There are also container adapters provided in C++. This is a container which is implemented using another container. And it's usually just a wrapper to limit the functionality or provide a different API. As an example, if you need a stack in your program, you could use an STD deck directly. However, using the STD stack container adapter hides all of the methods in deck that aren't required for using it as a stack. And it makes explicit how you are using that container. This is a list of the operations which most containers provide. Starting with C++11, a container should support move semantics for things like constructors and assignments. The exact method names you use may change depending on the type of the container. As an example, in containers like a vector or a deck, you call pushback to add elements. In a map, the method name is called insert. You really need to know the semantics of the methods your containers provide. For example, the behavior of operator bracket in the STL map container is a little bit surprising. If you look up an element using operator bracket in an STL map, and the key does not exist in the container, an entry with that key and a default constructed value will be placed in the map implicitly. This example code that we show will insert an entry with a key of 5 and an empty string as the value if no element with a key of 5 already exists in the map. If all you want to do is look up a particular entry by key without causing any side effects, you have to use find, not operator bracket. Every program has data that it needs to keep track of and containers provide the abstraction for managing and storing and traversing that data. When using a container, you will need to choose what you want to store in that container. A well-designed container will support elements that have value semantics or pointer semantics. If you want to store a type that has pointer semantics, it is helpful to use smart pointers rather than raw pointers in the container. It will make memory management much simpler. So which container is the best to use? Well, that will depend very much on how you are using it and what you're storing in it. For example, if you are looking up by key and your data set is large, you will want to use one of the associative containers like a map or a hash, not a sequential container like a vector or a deck. If you are queuing data between one part of your program and another, use a queue rather than a deck to make it explicit that elements are only being inserted on one end of the container and removed on the other. There is another aspect to consider, which are the standard functions, known as algorithms. 
The STL containers were designed with a common iterator interface, so you can use a given algorithm with multiple containers. As an example, the algorithm STD reverse will reverse the contents of the container. The same algorithm can be used for STD vector or even STD string without having to tell the algorithm what data is in the container. Now that we've talked about what a container is, we want to look at how the implementation affects the behavior. This is not just theoretical. If you have a given container and then change to use a different implementation, you may also need to change the code which uses the container. This means your code may not be portable if you're using a non-standard container implementation. One of the major advantages of the C++ standard container classes relative to other container libraries is the level of detail with which the standard specifies the containers. The standard specifies not only the obvious things like method names and what they do, but also when iterators are invalidated, how fast each method is, whether it moves or copies the data it's operating on, what happens if an exception is thrown while the operation is being done, and many other factors that turn out to matter a great deal. So here is one example of an implementation detail. Copy on write was a common technique that was used to improve the speed when copying large containers. One of the problems with copy on write is every other method that modifies the data turned out to be slower. Copy on write also has some interesting consequences for the way iterators behave. This is an example that we actually found in some code, and it was extremely challenging to track down and debug because it was not obvious what was happening. With a copy on write container, if you make a copy of the container, and then you use a const iterator to walk the original while removing certain elements. If you dereference the const iterator inside the loop, you will see the element you just removed because the const iterator is actually referring to the old copy of the data. This is a side effect of the fact that the container was implemented using copy on write. This code was depending upon the side effect which meant that it would only work with a container using copy on write. With the addition of move semantics in C++11, copy on write lost most of its value. In the C++11 standard, there are specifications which disallow a copy on write implementation for any container. As an example, according to the standard, operator bracket is not allowed to invalidate iterators. However, if your container is copy on write, you may need to make a copy of the container in the operator bracket implementation. This operation invalidates iterators and therefore your container will not be standard compliant. So given all of this, should you write your own containers? This is almost never a good idea. Let's take a look at a few other reasons other than no. If you think you need a custom container, this is a partial list of what you need to consider that the STL containers already provide for you. Do your containers support move semantics properly? If you are not using std move underscore if underscore no accept, you might have a bug. And users now have to learn your API as well as the STL container API. As another example, writing iterators can be tricky. It is very easy to be off by one in your reverse iterator and correct in the forward iterators. We have said you should avoid writing custom containers whenever possible. However, there are reasons why it might be required or necessary. You might need to support an extended API larger than the API provided by the STL containers. Another reason is you may have existing data structures in your program that you want to expose as a container to some STL algorithm. You may need a data structure 
in order to solve your problem that simply doesn't exist in the current standard library, like a bee tree or a radix tree. You may also need to store your data in an unusual representation. For example, qString8 is a container which stores a sequence of 32-bit values. By storing them as 8-bit segments and discarding unnecessary segments, this functionality of the container to present a view of the data that is different from the internal representation does not exist in any of the standard containers. One of our open source projects is the Copper Spice Libraries, and it has a set of custom containers. We knew the containers we inherited were not acceptable, and we also knew that continuing to use these custom containers was simply a bad idea. We wanted our containers in Copper Spice to support the API from the STL, in addition to our legacy API. Many of the custom containers in this legacy code use copy on write, which is not standard compliant. Containers were not exception safe, nor could you pass your own allocators. Containers like QList were known to have issues, and QMAP did not support a compare template parameter. So we knew the containers in Copper Spice had to be rewritten. We knew we wanted to re-implement the Copper Spice containers using the STL. Our first question was how should we use the STL containers? And picking between inheritance and composition was not a simple decision. The fact that the destructors in the STL are not virtual was one major red flag. We also encountered the problem that in the STL, size type is unsigned. Since the STL was standardized, it has been realized in the C++ community that size type really should have been signed. Signed arithmetic when indexing into a container provides more opportunities for the compiler to optimize the code. Unsigned arithmetic has no undefined behavior, so the compiler must consider integer wraparound. We talked to some of the standard library maintainers and asked them what thoughts they had on the matter. Oddly, most of them had no real preference in this area. Ultimately, we decided that using composition was a better idea, and the code turned out to be much more readable. Using composition did mean that we had to write a wrapper for every method in the STL. But in exchange for paying this cost, we got the guarantee that future changes in the STL will not silently change our API and break users of our code. It also gave us the benefit that the entire API is located in our container class, which makes it easier to document and understand. The Copper Spice containers were fully refactored from legacy custom code to wrappers for the STL containers. Since we have added support for the STL API, you can now use all of the STL algorithms with the Copper Spice containers. We also took the opportunity to add a new container called QFlatMap. This is an ordered map which stores elements in contiguous memory as a sorted vector of pairs. This is useful when you want to look up by key and your data set is relatively small. Since the Copper Spice library containers are implemented using the STL containers, these containers benefit as the STL is improved and as STL implementations are optimized by newer tool chains. For more information about the Copper Spice libraries, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching our video. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions, feel free to email us or leave a message on our Copper Spice form. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in two weeks for our next video.